And welcome back to the Constitutionals Podcast. I'm your host, Chad White. If you didn't know, this is the premier podcast for the website, cpluscomedy.com. Like I just said, it's a website. Go there. i got to find a better way to record this show. We're on a tight schedule today because the DSLR battery is about to die. Uh, and frankly, I'm not in a good mood, but <laughs> you know, you persevere. <clears throat> I don't know what's going on with my voice. I sound like a small child. I sound like I belong on uh, the TV shows Stranger Things. I'm in the zeitgeist. guys. I stopped watching after season one, but I'm in the zeitgeist. guys. <laughs> Just throwing open some uh, which McCall's going on here. How are you? How was your day? Good, great. I'm glad to see you uh, uh, doing your things. Getting a lot of uh, quarter quarterly numbers coming in for advertising and all that stuff. Uh, not advertising for the big company. What is wrong with my voice? Is I, I, I whatever. I just came back. I just got, I literally just got out of traffic. Uh, traffic's been horrible the past two days in Atlanta. Driving back from Buckhead towards the downtown area. In the hipster part. <laughs> what was I talking about? Q3. The end of the quarter, the fiscal quarter's up, and we're getting earnings for all of the most important uh, companies. Companies like Netflix, Amazon, Twitter. Twitter missed big. And I just saw a... Um, a uh, alert on deadline that said that uh, Amazon stock dives after big miss on Wall Street. It's important that these companies hit their numbers because that means the that 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 reiterates the investors' interest inside of the uh, for the company. So if a, if a company like Netflix uh, doesn't get and Netflix is this the uh, uh, the topic of um, Netflix's Q3 uh, failures are the topic of this week's news time. The news time that came out this week, very late, last night, <laughs> in fact. At the time of this recording, it is Thursday. So, you know, Wednesday. Uh, Netflix is, I really don't know what's wrong with my voice. I, it sounds extremely high and hoarse. Like a child, a sick child. <clears throat> but Netflix is... Uh, there we go. <laughs> it's getting lower. Netflix's uh, earnings, um, it missed subscriber numbers. It projected that I was going to gain, I think, 7 million new subscribers. It only gained 5 million. And that's not good. And all of these companies, all these big tech companies, uh, with I don't think, ex- with the exception of Amazon and Google, are and Facebook, I believe, are losing a crap ton of money. Tesla. Um, <laughs> hey, Google, stop. <laughs> it's embarrassing. There's a, that's what happens when you have a, I have a Google Home Mini in every room, except for a hub. I have a Google Home Hub in my bedroom, the one without the camera. But wait till I get the Hub Max with the camera. Oh, boy. Google's going to see me naked every single day. <laughs> but, but that's what happens when big tech companies, they, they're losing money. Netflix is, uh, WeWorks, all that stuff. WeWorks about to get a new CEO. But the Z, they're, they're, <laughs> they did mention, this is, an, this is interesting, nobody, but they did mention that there's at a meeting today, the, or yesterday, this week, I saw in the Wall Street Journal, that they're going to, that they told, that there it was rumored that there were going to be layoffs. And they're like, nah, they're going to be layoffs. And then at this meeting if, with, their, uh, with people that work at, at work at WeWork, you know, corporate, they go, yeah, there's going to be layoffs. But we don't know when, and we don't know who, or how many. <laughs> how sad is that? I'm laughing. But how sad is that? That these big tech unicorns that that, that get all that get millions of billions of dollars from investors. And what happens is, if you don't hit your marks, if all if you you have to make these projections because you are a big tech company because you're putting out all this stuff. Netflix has to say, hey, we yeah we might have a hundred million you know users, unique users, but we also want to get everybody to sign up. Everybody have their own account. Um, and I talked about password sharing in this week's news time. News time is the weekly daily daily show esque news show. Anyway, but if net but if the uh, but if Netflix doesn't hit this is the second quarter in a row as well where Netflix didn't hit its numbers. Same thing for Twitter. Twitter, I think this is the third consecutive quarter where it's just not growing and and uh, the ads, none of the stuff, none of the stuff's working. They're not getting users, ad, new ads, and all that crap, and they're just not making money. And so when you when that happens, investors have a chance to go, all right, well maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe 
it's not a good, maybe we should not give you so much money because you don't know what you're doing. And that's what happens. So there you go. There's a, that's a five minute thing. I have my phone in here to do the time and I just didn't do it this time. I had an interview today with uh, a comedian. Comedian Matt Besser, one of the founders of UCB. Uh, if you if you were watching this show, then you most likely know who Matt Besser is. He, Ian Roberts, Matt Walsh, and Amy Poehler all helped create UCB, a, a, a haven for young improvers, or old improvers, for improv teams to come together and do improv. Uh, located out of... New York, L.A., second season in Chicago, and Detroit. UCB is all over the place. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. They, they use Del Close's teachings and spread the gospel. Anyway, I talked to him for a couple of, maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> he has a new album out called Pot Humor, or it's coming out next week, uh, so which means I have to get the interview out next week. I also have three other interviews <laughs> ahead of him, so I got to get those out, you know, tomorrow, which is Friday, or the day that this goes up, which is Friday, and then uh, Monday through Thursday. I have a whole weekend of being alone, so. All right. <laughs> oh, God, I'm so sad and alone. And there's that. Oh, I'm supposed to. I don't want to talk about it. I was going to say I'm, I'm trying to set up a, an interview with somebody who's very big, but uh, we'll see if this is the same person that also didn't respond to me for another interview for someone who's very big like two years ago, right before she popped. Oof, I almost did the, the white supremacy sign again. <laughs> Be okay. <laughs> Let's get into this real quick story. It's from The Deadline, written by Dade, Dade Hayes. Amable Amazon Prime <laughs> viewing... Added to Nielsen, which reveals the boys' numbers. And if you recall, streaming uh, shows aren't typically collected by Nielsen because streamers don't want people to know how many people are watching shows because they think, you know, uh, numbers would yield. Revealing numbers would yield. This is my theory. They think, I, I believe that they think that uh, yielding numbers would, uh, would w- releasing numbers would yield, you know, lower viewers. You know what I'm saying? Like if, uh, like the only time you hear about big Nielsen numbers are when, or something vaguely along those lines are when, you know, Netflix says, Hey, so a lot of people watched, uh, stranger things. And then you go, well, how much? And they go, a hundred people, a hundred million people watch the premiere. And then you go, well, how many people <laughs> watch the other episodes? And they go, a lot of people watch the other episodes, <laughs> but if the number goes lower, um, <clears throat> Nielsen numbers are the, the numbers like, you know, 11 million people watch Big Bang Theory, um, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, but now Nielsen has a measurement. They a couple of years ago they created a measurement so that they'd be able to read the numbers that Netflix and Hulu and Amazon aren't releasing. I'm watching a bug fly around. Yesterday I was shooting the cold open of news time, and uh, and I was like, I this is like this is like my second or third take, and I was and I I walked on screen. I I was doing my whole thing, and. Uh, I felt something crawling on my neck and I thought, okay, it's, you know, sometimes I feel things crawling on me that aren't there. <laughs> I'm not crazy. I promise. I'm not crazy. And <laughs> sometimes I feel things are crawling on me that aren't there. And I felt something crawling right here and it, and it's going up the back of my neck. Uh, watch the video on youtube.com slash you comedy if you want to see me touch my neck. And uh, I go, and, and then if, like in a second sin, I go, I'm just going to, I'm just going to tap the back of my neck. I tap it and then I pull my hand away. And then as I pull, I feel like a scratch and I'm like, Oh my gosh. And I pull my hand away and there's a bug on my finger and it's, you know, it's not that big, but it's, it's a bug. And I, like I can feel a shell and everything. And I go, what the heck is that? And I'm holding it up to the camera and you'll see it on the blooper reel that you don't watch <laughs> that no one watches. 
In making the announcement of the Amazon edition, Nielsen also said the audience for The Boys, which is the comic book show that's very gory. I saw half of the premiere. I don't have, whoa. Never mind, I want to get into it. Because <laughs> I wasn't watching on my account. It was somebody else's account. Someone whom I love. <sighs> During the first 10 days. Of its availability was 4.1 million, with an average of 6 million watching its premiere episode. The eight-episode first season racked up 8 million total viewers from July 26th to August 4th. It's the first 10 days on the platform, with 39% of the audience between 35 and 49. Ooh, Jesus. Wow, that's, that's a pretty big number. The older crowd really liked it. Measuring TV viewing has never been an exact science, and Nielsen has come under increasing scrutiny as the competition for audiences has grown more intense. The dominant ratings company introduced streaming metrics in 2016, along with other improvements to traditional linear and on-demand viewing. Separately, Netflix has begun to offer more regular voluntary reports of select viewership numbers after refusing to reveal any statistics for several years. Uh, Nielsen is right for doing this, for pulling out, because if you're, if you're, I mean, I mean, this is kind of a service to not only your audience, but also to those other big companies like CBS, uh, Viacom, uh, like uh, HBO, like uh, Comedy Central, like all these other, like all these other channels that you're competing with. They want to know how you are doing. And just because, you know, a lot of people talk about a show doesn't necessarily mean that people are watching it. I talk about Crazy Ex-Girlfriend all the time. And, uh, I mean, no one watched it. 900,000 viewers per episode. It was in the bottom 50 shows watched on broadcast. It was one of the, one of, if not the least watched shows on broadcast. So there you go. Amazon is, uh, but I want to get back to that, that 39% of the audience to 35 and 49. That's, um, that is a big, big, uh, I think that sounds like a big margin. Um, you're really aiming for the 18 to 45 demo, but the, having an older group that's almost half of the the represents your viewership, um, that's really interesting, especially for a comic book show uh, that you know is competing with the likes of when it came out, um, Preacher and the DC stuff. The DC stuff, this Arrowverse kind of skews uh, younger because it's all these sexy people complaining about you know being sexy and stuff. And then there's also, uh, with the exception of Black uh, Lightning, which <laughs> which is just a show about uh, black people <laughs> who happen to have superpowers. Uh, and then, you know, the Marvel shows, they don't exist anymore. But when they did, uh, it was, it's, you know, um, uh, it's slightly more gritty, but not much, not much more. Uh, and then we have, you know, Marvel's Runaways and and Cloak and Dagger, which I started watching. Cloak and Dagger, not half bad. It takes a very long time to start, though. Uh, but they, then we have those shows that are that are skewing towards the Arrowverse sexy teens or mad at each other uh, thing. So with the boys being as... Oh, Vice Investigates sets a series sets Hulu run. Wow, that's good. Go on Hulu. You don't need a... Yeah, appearing monthly with episodes appearing monthly. Great. Uh, <laughs> breaking news. Um... But, you know, that just goes to show that there's a whole market out there for superhero things that aren't um, this uh, Marvel DC expanding universe thing. Look at look at Joker. Look at Joker. That's a DC black label movie uh, in quotes. I put that in quotes because I think that's what Todd, uh, the director, Todd, what's his face? He said he wanted to do a line of DC black labels, which is just like darker, grittier, uh, low cost, low budget movies. Uh, with DC characters, they aren't necessarily superheroes, but you know, just whatever. Uh, so interesting to see, but yeah, the boys like the boy and like like Preacher. Look at Preacher. Preacher was such a good show. Uh, you know, ended before uh, it could really tell a whole comic book story, but uh, it did get an ending. So there's that. He found God in a hopeless place. That's not <laughs> that is <laughs> that just ruined the entire show. <laughs> Who cares? No one watched it. If you're going to watch Preacher, you're going to watch Preacher. You know, you should watch it by now. I like, from what I saw of the boys, I liked it. Okay. Let us, uh, let's take a break. And then we'll move on to the next topic. <laughs> Sorry. 
Jesus. All right. Three, two, one. Well, we're back on this fight, guys. Jesus, this is this is just a freaking cacophony of things. I so I start the I start the second part of this show, and then I lean on for the first time in a hundred and thirty two episodes. I pull the headphones out of the microphone. Microphone essentially, if you if you plug anything in or out of the microphone while it's recording or while audition is open auditions like, Hey, you change the, you change the hardware, even if you plug in headphones, cause it just registers headphones in a different way. And, uh, long story short, I had to restart this show twice or once. <laughs> <sighs> Stupid show. Let's, uh, let's look at this vice investigates going to Hulu. Vice Media, which has been reshuffling its TV partnership plans after its long-term relationship with HBO wound down several months ago, set a, a premiere date on Hulu of Vice Investigates. I guess they just can't call it Vice anymore. The Hulu original show, from the producers and correspondents of Vice News, will set the first three episode go. Whoa. We'll see the first three episode <laughs> episode go live on a streaming service on November first. Remaining installments in the ten episode series will appear monthly. In the tradition of the original Vice on HBO, the new series will span the world, blah, blah, blah. So is, is Vice on HBO, but on Hulu. I wonder if, uh, so HBO is probably going to keep the, uh, the, the Vice back catalog, the first five seasons that they did, um, which the last two, three seasons have been 20 episodes, and then one, ep- one season was 40 episodes, which is like HBO gave you money to do that, and uh, then they canceled this pact. You know what? Maybe this is just a hunch, and I know Vice has been losing money hand over foot, and they've been not been not been able to retain uh, uh, not only viewership but also reader numbers. But perhaps it's that Disney Disney invested money into Vice, uh, and they have not been they've not been able to recoup any of those losses. Uh, after I think it was like a four billion value, four billion dollar valuation of Vice. I think Vice is now worth like way less than I know it was in the billion, but I know it's it's worth way way less than what uh, what Disney thought it. I think it's like four hundred million now, uh, which is not because Disney whatever. Anyway, look, look up the numbers. Uh, I'm not gonna look it up. This is not the type of show. <laughs> but uh, you know if you know. Uh, HBO is owned by Warner Media, which is owned by AT and T, which is putting out its own streaming service to compete with Netflix and Disney Plus and Hulu and Amazon. So maybe they just want to, you know, not not have to deal with all that stuff. I don't know. Vice is great. I think Vice is uh, good. The TV shows uh, they talk they do talk about marijuana a lot, but they, <laughs> they talk about drugs and prostitution a lot. Uh, but I think I think Vice is good. It's something. That is needed. <laughs> okay. This is such a stupid show. And then they also, you know, Hulu also has uh, the weekly from New York Times, which only comes out, I would say, a, on a monthly basis too. So there you go. Add that to the uh, pile of things I talked about. <clears throat> Next up, this comes from Vulture, Matt Zoller Sites. Disney is quietly placing cl- classic Fox movies into its vault, and that's worrying. You may recall, and if you are if you are nineties if you are nineties uh, babe, you may recall that Disney has a vault, and uh, periodically they'll take a movie and put it in the vault, or take a movie, take it out of the vault, release a special edition of it. Lion King's been in the vault. Sleeping Beauty. You may remember the commercials. Uh, all those all the movies that they have, you know, just to. Jeez. Oh, I'm getting a spam call. Well, now we can see uh, Google call screening in uh, action. It's from a 715 number. I don't owe any money to anybody, so we'll see what happens. Well, I do owe money for college. but So this is a Google call screen. If you've never seen Google, they hung up. <laughs> they hung up. <laughs> Andy Hoosers. Uh, what was I talking about? The Vault. So uh, they, they did it. Lion King, Sleeping Beauty, 
and now they're going to do it with Fox movies. Uh, that's not good because they're, Disney's uh, essentially doing what you know, they they're raising the value of movies of their movies only their movies um, so that you won't be able to get them. You know if um, if you wanted to buy Cinderella because uh, I, I remember seeing like all the all the different movies like Fox, even Fox and Hound. But if you want to see like, something like Cinderella or Fox and Hound uh, in two thousand and two and you wanted to, and you didn't own the VHS and you wanted to buy the VHS and it just wouldn't be out. You just wouldn't have it. You have to pay, you know, right now you probably still have to pay a hundred dollars for a Cinderella VHS um, or a Cinderella DVD. Cause it's probably not even on Blu-ray or it, or it is. And it costs too much. Same thing with the Lion King. Lion King diamond edition costs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who cares? Uh, boom, 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 boom. Let's see what's going on. I wish I read this. Let's see. For this year's horror marathon, some guy wanted to screen. I didn't want to say this guy's name. Wanted to screen the original 1976 version of The Omen and the 1986 remake of The Fly, two of hundreds of older 20th century Fox features that became the property of Walt Disney Corporation after the purchase. Blah blah. blah. Oh Jesus! In the preceding few months, Neff, uh, the guy, had heard rumblings in his Google group of film programmers that Disney was about to start treating older Fox titles as they do older Disney titles, making them mostly unavailable for, uh, to for-profit theaters. Oof. Uh, when Neff's requests to screen *The Fly* and *The Omen* were denied via the Drexel which handles the logistics of booking a programmer's requested titles, he realized the rumors were true and that he had to stop screening Fox films altogether. Oh my gosh. Wow. And that's sad. That's really sad. Uh, movies all across the world or all across the United States, like at drive-ins and stuff, they're being taken off the screens. You can't screen old Fox films like alien aliens, say anything. The princess bride, Moulin Rouge. Oh, fight club. Oh my gosh. So if you, I own the Fight Club Special Edition on Blu-ray. So if I didn't have that, then or like, or if you wanted, to, if there was like a, if it was Fight Club's uh, anniversary, you wouldn't be able to watch it. Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street, all about Eve, The Sound of Music, Deadpool, The Revenant, The Simpsons movie. Oh my gosh! Oh, okay, okay. They could do that. They could do those. But oh my gosh. That's crazy. Disney officially denied to comment for this piece, but a film distributor with firsthand knowledge of the company's policy says it is directed at theaters that screen first run Disney and Fox content alongside older titles. Oh, so it's like art theaters. I have a, there's an art theater right near me. And, um, so if you want to come murder me, then, uh, go ahead. I got nothing to live for. <laughs> That's incredibly disappointing. I never even thought of that with this acquisition. You know, people lose jobs and you're not going to be able to screen your mo- screen movies that, because, uh, you know, there's um, movie screenings all the time of old films. If you, if you live in a, you know, in certain cities, like in Atlanta, I, you hear at this uh, um, art house movie theater, there's one, there's one in Buckhead that, that does that as well. Um and then, you know, regular AMCs, they do it all the time for, you know, I'm sure on the anniversary of Apollo 13 blowing up. Is that the one? Or Apollo 11? <laughs> Look, I don't know my history. It's 532. <laughs> that's, inc- that's incredibly disappointing. I don't want to see that. Fox Classics are going to the vault as well for reasons the company won't publicly explain or justify. A Disney valuification of Fox titles is bad news for movie theaters that depend on repertory screenings to shore up their increasingly shaky bottom lines. The decision to broaden Disney's artificial scarcity tactic to include thousands of movies released by a one-time rival is a wounding blow to a swath of theatrical venues that used to be able to show them and where film buffs were able to see them with an audience. That seems like the thesis about halfway through. You know, I thought about Jesus, crap it a bucket. This is a, this is a whole essay. <laughs> you know, I thought about, um, oh, they also own uh, The Descendants and 12 Years a Slave Now, The Shape of Water. Wow. Uh, those are all Fox films. Um, I was thinking about this a couple of, or yesterday. We used to, like, when you're in college and high school, they teach you to put the thesis, you know, the whole 
uh, reason why the, the essay is being written, like in the first paragraph. Uh, but quickly you'll learn. <laughs> uh, not quickly, but if you, if you, you know, if you go to school for writing, uh, or if you have a, a, a half, half decent teacher, you learn that you can put the thesis pretty much anywhere in the first half. Uh, I mean, truly you can put a thesis anywhere and then restate it continually, uh, you know, throughout the piece. But, uh, I find it, you know, all these, every, you know, Vulture, the Atlantic, Washington Post, uh, Breitbart, uh, <laughs> this name of the name of the name of the place that I really don't read and I shouldn't be reading that no one should be reading. Uh, that's holy, that's super racist. But you, but you, all these people, you know, on the on the internet now, they write all these think pieces. Jezebel, Gizmodo, Kotaku, IGN, you know, all these places, and uh, AV Club. And then you know, I, I and I read some of them, like the Atlantic and you know, all that stuff. And you realize that uh, a lot of people, <laughs> I'm not gonna say aren't good writers, but a lot of people, either a continue to write like that high school thing. Uh, which, you know, there's people my age that do it, people older than me that still do that. Uh, or B, they, they, they have found their own voice, but it's, I'm not going to say informal because you can be, you know, there's plenty of people writing informally and it's still fine. Um, and it's, or, or it's really good or it's horrible. Uh, but it's kind of, it's kind of like, God, I don't want to say bad. And I don't want to say informal. But it's kind of like as if the writing stinks. <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean, but the writing stinks. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm the be all end all. I'm not saying I'm the best writer, but the writing is just not there. And there's a there's a very long uh, post from the Atlantic that I think about constantly, and it's called "My Family's Slave." And it came out, I think, about four years ago. It was about a family that took in a, 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 a poor Asian woman and she just she basically was a slave to them. Uh, and this is like in the modern, in modern century times. <laughs> and uh, it's very long and very meaty and it's a very good piece of writing. And then, you know, cut to three or three or four years later, you uh, and I urge you to go to read it. It's a really good piece. Then you know, cut to a few years later, same website. Um, someone is writing <laughs> an opinion, an opinion piece that is, I like this. This is good. This is why this show good. This is why the politics are bad. And uh, and you know, it's everybody has their own style. Um, and that I guess I mean I guess that's why I start writing think pieces or, or essays. Uh, I call them essays. Now they're called think pieces. But I, you know, I think that's just why I stopped writing those because it was just everybody's doing it, and it just became less special. Um, so there's that. Disney's putting movies in the vault. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, De Niro and Pacino. They they had a there's a New York Times profile on them. Uh, if you if you read if you click on the links that I put inside the show notes or on the website. It is, you know, you just, they're usually just links. It says like vulture.com slash uh, forward slash backslash 2019 backslash uh, 10 backslash Disney dash is dash quietly, you know, the rest of the thing. But this one for the New York times profile of De Niro and Pacino starring in the Irishman coming on Netflix in a month. This one at the very end of the, of the URL, it says, percent sign two farts <laughs> what that's insane why does it say that uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this but go read it it's a very good profile I read it uh, not even an hour before I started driving home <laughs> from work <laughs> as you see I wasn't going to talk about anything today because I'm truly not in the mood, because my mood from last week is carrying over. I was going to talk about the comics I read. I found the website where I can read... Ooh, I'm just about to implicate myself. I <laughs> I am reading... I read some comics. <laughs> Legally. <laughs> I read um, The Button. It's a, these are both DC comics. The Button and uh, Rebirth. I, yeah, Rebirth. No, no, no. Yeah, Rebirth. Rebirth. It was The Button and Rebirth. So I read Rebirth, which is... 
DC was doing. Let me finish this real quick. <laughs> uh, go read it. It's uh, let's see who wrote this. It talks about them starring together. Dave Itzkoff uh, did, did a really good job. Um, this is what your one article preview. What? Go read it. I thoroughly enjoyed the profile he did for both of these gentlemen. On New York Times. Uh, but I, but anyway, I, so Rebirth is uh, DC Comics uh, restarting. It's basically what it did was there's a there's a comic event. They do comic events all the time. They and they do crossovers with everybody. Superman's hanging out with Batman and Wonder Woman. They call themselves the Trinity. Uh, it's really weird to see them say that those words out loud. <laughs> well, I wish they would do it in the movies. Um, and you know, you know, it's, uh, the Teen Titans are hanging out with you know, Static Shock or whatever. Anyway, um, they did uh, a couple of years ago. D- DC rebooted themselves and comic books, Marvel and DC do this all the time. And I hate when people just don't know that, uh, batteries about that, but Mar, uh, but DC rebooted, they did, they rebooted it the first time with the new 52. The new 52 was just 52 weeks for 52 weeks straight. They're going to have every series that they, that they redo is going to have a new comic 52 weeks straight. Um, and uh, eventually DC got tired of that. And like, I think like a year and a change and, uh, or they, they, this is like the initial thing. So then they did new 52 and then new 52 uh, was, was basically an amalgamation of the silver age and golden age of, you know, the DC comics and, you know, the Superman, you know, but you know, just rebooted. Uh, but then they re they restarted again with rebirth, which is bringing, and convergence, bringing together all of the multiverses <laughs> inside of the DC universe. So we have Earth One, Earth Two, all these different, uh, you know, noirs and all this, all the different universes and stuff. Bring them all together into one world, and then I, so that was that was Rebirth, and it's all because of the Flash, baby. The Flash is the best superhero in the world. That's my favorite superhero. Uh, and then uh, Green Lantern, um, and maybe Wolverine. <sighs> So, oh, Static Shock. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's what that is. And then I read uh, the button, which is a continuation of Rebirth. So everybody's trying to figure out. Uh, the Flash is the only person who I think it's Wally West Flash who can who can remember everything, and no one else can. And then so ba- it's up to Batman and Barry Allen Flash to figure out what's going on. All the worlds are disappearing, and they're coming together. So that's what that is. Anyway, whatever. I read that. <laughs> Listen, if you like what you heard here. Head on over to the website, cbluescomedy.com, where there's uh, some uh, interviews. Like I just said, I got, uh, let me just name the people who I have, who I've interviewed. I've interviewed Emma Willen. I've interviewed Matt Koff. I've interviewed Gino Seegers. Uh, Matt Koff is a writer on The Daily Show who's releasing an album. Gino Seegers is on Perfect Harmony on NBC and Matt Besser, who is releasing a, whatchamacallit, an album. Matt Besser was, this is not a knock to anybody else I spoke to uh, in the past, you know, year. Matt Besser was a delight. (laughs) Everybody has been a delight. Matt Besser has been, he was great. You know, to talk to somebody that big in the comedy world and then to, uh, uh, (laughs) hold on, I'm typing something. (laughs) I was typing in. I was typing in the notes. Um, <laughs> it's not somebody that big in the comedy world. <laughs> it was just it was just. I'm so honored, I, and I can't wait to talk to. Hopefully, the next person is oh boy. I've been this one. I've been working on for about two months because I was I was notified two months ago, and it's been in the back of my mind. Like I gotta get. I gotta. I can't wait till November to talk to this person. So definitely head to the website, see those com, see those interviews. Uh, if you want to see a video version of this show, go to youtube.com slash people's comedy. Um, see the, the whole, me and all of my flannel wearing glory. I've been wearing a flannel the whole time. You didn't even know, baby. <laughs> nice uh, black and gray flannel. Is this blue? Mm, it's like light blue to me. Oh my gosh, it might be light blue. I thought this was gray. It, there's, I mean, it's gray. I thought it was, it's navy. It's navy, light blue, and gray. Whatever. Wearing this flannel, I rarely wear. It's not even ironed. Wore it to work today. All on button with the shirt under it. I look so cool. No big deal. <laughs> so you want to see that? And then there's also the weekly news show, News Time. 
uh, very entertaining, very, I do my best. I truly do my best. It's my favorite show to do. I love it so much. Hopefully these new shows that I'm thinking about are coming out <laughs> at some point. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs>